And hello again, everyone. Welcome to tonight's presentation of Fruits and Supplements, Eating Right with SCI. My name is Franklin. I'm one of the two co-founders of NorCal SCI. Um, as usual, these presentations are made possible through a generous grant that we received from the Reef Foundation, so we're grateful to them. Uh, a couple of uh, our rules and housekeeping items. Uh, everyone has been muted, and that way we don't have any background distractions. Uh, at the end of the presentation, Shelly is going to be taking your questions. So if you have any that you wish to ask of her, feed them to me through the chat feature on your screen. And again, it'll be about 10 minutes session uh, for Q&A. And then also, uh, as always, we are recording these sessions and we will make them available to everyone who has registered uh, first thing tomorrow morning. We're gonna couple it with uh, a presentation that we had on Tuesday night uh, featuring Arash, who uh, did some demonstrations of cooking with vegetables. So we thought that uh, might be a good uh, sort of tandem of videos for, for you to enjoy tomorrow. So look for those in your inbox tomorrow morning. Okay, so let me go ahead and um, get started and introduce Shelly. She's a lifelong advocate of nutrition, uh, and she has been, uh, when she's not working with her patients, she can be found in her greenhouse or kitchen. She obtained her BS in nutritional science from San Jose State University in 20, uh, 2012, my alma mater. Uh, she got her master's degree in public health in 2016 from the University of New England and has been working at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center in San Jose, one of the top spinal cord injury rehab hospitals in, on the, in the country. Uh, she currently works in the outpatient clinic of the hospital, seeing primarily those with uh, spinal cord injuries and also spends time working with complex GI issues in the outpatient gastroenterology clinic. Uh, she's also a member of NorCal CI's advisory board, and uh, we are just thrilled to have uh, Shelly tonight do her presentations on fruits and supplements. So here's Shelly Wood. All right. Let's see. Let me get the screen up. Oops, hold on one second, sorry. Okay. Give me one second. It's good to be here again. Um, I have to tell you, I really enjoyed R. Ash's presentation um, on Tuesday. It was fantastic. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to see that, then uh, you should definitely check it out. Um, so can everybody see what I'm looking at right now, my presentation? Yeah, you're um, good. Good, okay, just checking. Okay, so let's chat about fruits and supplements today. Um, we've done a lot of talking about plant-based eating, um, done a lot of talking about vegetables, tons of talking about vegetables. Um, Arash and I are huge advocates for eating your veggies, but um, fruits are important as well. And so um, in this presentation, I wanna talk about different myths that you might've heard about eating fruit. Um, seasonality, we'll talk about the glycemic index because that tends to come up with um, people who talk about fruit tend to talk about the glycemic index. Um, of course, we're gonna talk about research. Um, there is not a ton of research just on fruit, but um, I did find some. Um, health benefits, how much you should eat, um, mostly pertaining to carbohydrates since fruits fall into the carbohydrate category. Um, then we're gonna do a little bit of rainbow reminder and we'll chat about the different colors and the benefits of variety and why you should eat from the rainbow. Um, ways to incorporate more fruit into your diet. Um, then we're gonna take a walk through some of the common supplements that, um, that patients with spinal cord injury might be taking or be interested in taking. So I picked five of the most common supplements to talk about. Um, and then just a, a quick refresher on caloric density and why that, that is important. So before we get started, um, I just want to fix my screen. I don't. Our practice run was perfect, go figure. Anyways, before we get started, I just wanna remind you that nutrition can be really technical. Um, the reason why I break all this down for you um, is because I want you to be more informed about your nutrition and um, I want you to be able to understand it better so that you can make better decisions for yourself. Um, knowing more about food is gonna help you get more invested in eating healthfully. The more you know, 
the better. Um, much of the information that I talk about is applicable to everybody, not just those with spinal cord injury, but um, wherever I can find anything pertaining to spinal cord injury, of course, I'm gonna bring that up. Um, there are specific things that benefit those with spinal cord injury nutrition wise, so I'm definitely gonna um, share them with you. So let's start off with some myths. Um, the first myth is there's no difference between fresh and dried fruits. Um, that is not true. In dried fruits, um, you know the moisture is taken out. So, so nutrients and calories are super concentrated. Um, fresh fruits filled with water and minerals and vitamin C. Um, the main issue with uh, dehydrated fruits is the fact that vitamin C is a uh, heat sensitive vitamin. So you reduce uh, or lose quite a bit of vitamin C um, when you're eating dehydrated fruits. Um, fresh fruit has water. Water helps keep you full and hydrated and satisfied. Um, but dried fruit still has a lot of fiber and vitamins and minerals. Um, it's just more concentrated in calories. Um, tends to be um, easier to overdo and eat too many. So if you eat dried fruit, um, just make sure it doesn't have added sugar. I know a lot of dried fruit um, has added sugar, which always confused me because fruit is already sweet as it is. Why would anyone put more sugar? But that is how it, it happens. And um, so if you do eat dried fruit, it's great once in a while. It's nice for a on the go kind of snack. Just don't eat too much of it. Um, as far as fruits and diabetes, um, this I hear almost on a daily basis with the um, patients I work with who have diabetes. Um, many of them say, I can't have fruit, I'm a diabetic. Not true. Again, um, eating more whole fruits, and I talk about this quite a bit, um, particularly blueberries, grapes, and apples. Um, there was some research on blueberries, grapes, and apples is uh, significantly associated with a lower risk for type 2 diabetes. Um, greater consumption of fruit juices, which I talk more about later, is associated with a much higher risk of, of developing type 2 diabetes. Um, again, whole fruit has fiber, and fiber helps reduce large spikes in blood sugar, and it contributes to more satisfaction and fullness when you're eating um, fresh fruit, and it helps with bowel function. So, uh, so fresh fruit is great for diabetics. It's great for everybody. Another myth I've heard, uh, fruit juice just as healthy as eating the whole fruit, not true. Um, as I mentioned, whole fruit is much more preferable. Uh, juices often have added sugars in them and they're missing all the natural fiber unless you can stomach full pulpy orange juice. Um, that, that is a nice, a nice treat once in a while, but most juices are missing all the natural fiber from the fruit, which, which can lead to overconsumption of calories. You're basically drinking sugar and calories. Um, juice consumption is linked to childhood obesity. It's linked to tooth decay, and it is the first thing that I suggest um, for weight or diabetes management, um, just not to drink any sugar-sweetened beverages, including juice. And then the last myth is uh, fresh is best. Not true. Uh, fresh is great, but in many cases, frozen fruits and vegetables, um, they're picked at their peak of ripeness usually and flash frozen at their peak. So in some cases, um, our fruits and veggies travel far and wide sometimes, but in some cases, frozen fruits um, and frozen vegetables are um, more nutritious because they're, they're flash frozen right at their peak of ripeness and, um, and they retain that in the freezer. Um, the farther things travel, the less nutritious they are. If you don't have access to fresh and local produce, then you, then, you know, frozen fruit is great. Canned uh, options are okay. Um, you just wanna watch um, for uh, added sugars. You wanna watch for added sauce. Um, salt in canned produce. Um, I'd like to talk a lot more about salt, but I won't do that tonight. Um, plain frozen fruit is fantastic for smoothies. So um, as long as it's just uh, the fruit itself in the, the bag and no sugar. So seasonality, I wanna talk about that, um, elaborate a little bit more. I talk about fruits and veggies and produce traveling far. Um, Fruits and vegetables that are grown locally or in your region are definitely fresher, tastier. They're more nutritionally dense than, uh, than those that are flown around the world. Um, 
Again, vitamin C is very sensitive. It's a sensitive vitamin. So it's sensitive to heat. It's also sensitive to, to just you know, travel and, and the longer uh, time goes by uh, from the time that something that's high in vitamin C is picked, the less vitamin C. It decreases pretty rapidly. Additionally, a lot of our produce is um, um, subjected to ripening agents or gases or temperatures. Uh, things are picked super unripe and then they're, uh, they're um, gassed to, to make them ripe upon their destination. So you won't get that with anything you buy at the farmer's market or anything local or anything you grow yourself. Um, so also another fact of uh, eating in season, um, you're automatically rotating your produce and mixing up the nutrients that your body needs. So if you try to eat um, by the season, you are automatically eating the rainbow because um, uh, broccoli and cauliflower grows better here in the winter time and tomatoes grow better in the summer. And so you're gonna mix up your, uh, your produce and thus you're gonna mix up your nutrition, which is really beneficial. Um, eating seasonally supports your local farmers. Um, it's inherently better for the environment since uh, your fruits and veggies are not on a, a truck and traveling or on a plane or something like that. So um, better for the environment too. This is taught off the press. I just want to share Emma's garden. Um, I got these pictures tonight and th that makes me so happy. Uh, but I want to mention another thing about seasonality is if you can grow your own produce, um, that there is just nothing compared to that. And I don't have the scoop on exactly what Emma has here in her garden, but um, some of the other pictures were uh, super green heavy. So greens are really easy to grow here in California. Um, our climate supports them, especially in the cooler months. Um, you can also do onions, potatoes, and beets easily. Um, summer's a really good time for tomatoes, squash, and bell peppers, and a ton of other vegetables. And there's a lot of good resources out there on adaptive gardening. So. I highly recommend if you can, if you have the space, I highly recommend um, trying to do some gardening and, and um, the freshness, you just can't compare. Okay, so let's talk about the glycemic index. Um, this concept came out in about 1980, 1981 at the University of Toronto. Basically the glycemic, glycemic index is uh, where values are assigned to single foods based on how quickly or slowly they raise your blood sugar, um, otherwise known as glycemic response. Um, the higher glycemic index numbers raise blood sugar more rapidly um, and they compare everything to pure sugar, which has, it has a GI or glycemic index of 100. So all foods compared to pure sugar and they're given this value. Um, that seems great uh, if you just look at it like that, but there's cons because everybody has a different response um, and it can vary drastically from one person to the next. Um, in one study, they had a glycemic response of 50 grams of one food, the same food, it ranged from low to high and the responses between different participants varied by up to 60 points. Um, so one person might have a quick GI response to, to this food, the same exact amount of food as this other person who has a really slow response. So uh, using the GI index is not, um, not a very trustworthy thing to do. I wouldn't lean everything on the GI index because everybody varies. Um, and another thing is, is these index rates, they're based on individual foods. But when you start to mix your foods together, I mean, who eats just one food at a time? Um, so say you're looking at um, a bowl of fruit and you're worried about the GI index, but all the different fruits have different indexes. And so the whole thing is going to be, uh, it's, it, it's, hard, it's too, too hard to use. So, um, so dietitians don't really like to use a glycemic index and I wouldn't recommend getting too hung up on it. So current research on fruit. Um, there were a few studies that I was able to find, um, a review of randomized control trials, randomized as in, um, people were picked randomly and put in one group or the other. Um, it suggested, the findings suggested that increasing whole fresh fruit consumption promoted weight maintenance or even modest weight loss over three to 24 weeks. Um, another study suggested consuming whole fresh fruit tends to decrease calorie intake, 
particularly when consumed prior to a meal or when replacing more energy dense or calorie dense foods. Um, and then there was another one where um, it looked at uh, all the different studies over time. Um, and, and the findings suggest that eating more fruit on a daily basis is not associated with weight change. And it could actually be moderately protective against weight gain over five or more years. So eating fruit, um, good for your weight, you know, it's, it's good for your health. Um, there is no research that says that eating fruit is um, inherently bad for you or that can cause diabetes. So um, I hope everyone is not afraid to eat fruit now. <laughs> How much is recommended? So um, in looking at carbohydrates, because fruit falls into the carbohydrate um, category, again, a reminder, you need carbohydrates in a healthy diet. You really do. Um, rec I would recommend 45 to 65% of your diet should be carbs, um, three servings of whole grains per day, and then um, five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables per day. So the veggies fall in, I would say two to three servings of fruits a day would be good for most people. Mixing it up, um, likely to be higher on a plant-based diet, actually, if you're eating mostly plants, as in um, fruits, veggies, and whole grains. Um, then you're probably going to be consuming more carbohydrates, but fear not because these are carbohydrates that are packed with nutrients and fiber. Um, so especially helpful for weight management and uh, overall health. And it's a source that matters. So this is just a reminder, um, high quality carbohydrates have essential vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that our body needs. Um, high quality carbs have fiber, which slows the digestion of sugar and starches. It prevents large spikes in blood sugar and insulin, which is associated with diabetes and heart disease and weight gain. So um, all, of, all of those things are, um, if you have a plant-based diet, it's, it's protecting, uh, protective of, of all of these things. And high quality is whole grains, veggies, fruits. Fruit is a, definitely a high quality carbohydrate. So we're going to talk about the rainbow. If you um, if you watched my last presentation, I had to pronounce all of these in a painful way, but I'm not going to do that this time. But you can see um, that eating the rainbow will give you all of these um, protective antioxidants. Um, and I just want to say a word about balance. So this is why it's super important to eat a wide variety of color of fruits and vegetables. Um, if you're eating kale tons of kale all the time, that, that can be pretty bad because kale is a really good source of calcium. However, if you're eating a ton of kale, then you're probably gonna subject yourself to, to having a kidney stone perhaps or something like that. So it's really important that you don't eat too much of one thing. So that's why eating seasonally is really helpful. So by the time you've overdone it on apples, your tree is empty, you, you know, or, or we're moving on to the next fruit. Um, so these are just some of the chemical compounds that we have that are abundant in a plant-based diet um, in all uh, fruits and vegetables. And many of these things um, are really protective, uh, inhibit cancer growth and cardiovascular disease, fight inflammation um, associated with low blood pressure, longevity in some animal studies, um, better function of the lining of arteries and reduce blood pressure and so on. So, Let's talk about red. So red fruits, red vegetables, also red fruits, anything red that grows. Um, the powerhouse food that I chose to highlight was raspberries. I love raspberries. And uh, just a cup of these provide over 50% of the minimum daily target for your vitamin C. Um, supports immunity, skin health, helps produce collagen for skin. Um, has manganese and vitamin K, which both play a role in bone health. Um, and then smaller amounts of other nutrients. And there's um, a whole host of red um, uh, fruits here. I mean, blood oranges, cherries are absolutely one of my favorite fruits are cherries. I love them. And um, so, so red, think red, uh, reducing tumor growth, cancer and stroke risk, um, promotes memory function, healthy aging, heart, uh, prostate health. So um, eat your red. Orange, um, so orange and yellow fruits, I chose to spotlight oranges because we have a fantastic orange tree. 
Um, obviously, when, when you think of vitamin C, you think of orange oranges. Um, one medium orange has 117% of the daily value for vitamin C. So done, one and done, just uh, vitamin C in one little package. Um, vitamin C also enhances absorption of iron from other foods. So if you have um, been experiencing anemia or anything like that, um, having a little bit of vitamin C with your iron containing foods. So um, have an orange. Um, beans have a great amount of iron. Uh, you can cook from a cast iron skillet. Um, have yourself some vitamin C on the side there and you're, you're going to be absorbing better iron. Your, um, the absorption is enhanced with vitamin C. Just know that. Um, also, uh, oranges have fiber, calcium, magnesium, potassium, uh, and a bunch of other nutrients, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals. Um, vitamin, uh, orange and yellow fruits promote vision and immune system function, um, can reduce cancer risk and heart disease. Uh, so yay, oranges. <laughs> um, green fruits. So another one I chose to highlight here was the green apple. We have a green apple tree. I can applesauce and eat apples. Um, <laughs> they're amazing. Um, a medium apples packed with vitamins and minerals full of antioxidants, full of fiber, um, all these vitamins and um, green fruits and, and vegetables uh, can help prevent macular degeneration, boost immune function, maintain healthy bones and teeth, among other things. And we have blue and purple um, fruits. So obviously blueberries, um, another one of my all time favorites, a cup of blueberries will provide 24% of your vitamin C. Um, as well as so many other nutrients, irons, a good source of iron there, um, calcium, magnesium, um, again, can reduce tumor growth, cancer, stroke risk, uh, promote memory function, healthy aging, heart, prostate health. Again, um, I am repeating myself. So basically, uh, the gist of all of this is to eat uh, from the rainbow. Definitely want to eat all the colors that you can get your hands on um, for all of these these nutrients. Um, and then white fruits. So the white peach comes to mind, um, lots of vitamin C again. And um, this, uh, this particular color can help maintain cholesterol level or improve cholesterol level. So this category is kind of short, um, which is fine. I, I heard somewhere that the bright colors of fruits and vegetables are to attract animals to them, uh, something like that. And white is not, not all that fun. So we've got bananas and white nectarines, white peaches um, in the fruit category that is. Not very colorful, but still very nutritious and tasty. So how do you incorporate more fruit? <clears throat> Keep it where you can see it is probably one of my biggest um, tips. Um, put your whole fruits in a, in a bowl on the counter where you can see it. Um, better yet, chopped into a bowl in the refrigerator if you can do do it in a glass bowl or a glass container so you can see it, so you don't forget it. Um, that's even more helpful, especially if it's chopped and ready to go. Um, explore the produce section, pick fruits based on color. You know, what colors are you um, eating? Uh, I tend to gravitate toward red myself and I have to remind myself that there's other colors. Um, so definitely mix it up, go for all the different colors. Try something you've never tried before. Um, Google information about it. If you go to the farmer's market, it, that's a great time to talk to uh, the farmers and find out like, well, what is this weird looking fruit or vegetable? Um, what would I do with it? How would I cook it? Um, even the produce section, uh, we have a really nice guy at our Lucky's and I'm constantly talking to him. He sees me coming right when I walk in the door. Um, and I, I always have questions for him on things that I'm finding in the produce section. Um, think about adding fruits to your salad. Um, Citrus and apples are really, really good in salad and their vitamin C will help boost that iron absorption. So if you have salads with beans and you put in uh, some fruit in there, some citrus, um, that'll help you with your iron. Um, eat fruit whole. So uh, people ask me all the time about juicing. Um, much prefer that you eat it whole. Um, juicing was a big thing years ago. Um, where you would juice it and it would spit out all the pulp and all the nutrients and um, don't waste your money on a juicer. If you use a Vitamix or something, some power, high powered blender, um, 
where you just throw the whole thing in there, that's okay too. But I just want to mention that um, there is a lot going on when you eat um, a lot physiologically with your body and um, drinking your foods too often is not a good idea because um, as soon as you take your first bite of something, say an apple, um, you start to chew your food and your brain sends a signal to your stomach and your, your gut telling you there's nutrition coming. And um, the, just the act of chewing your food tells your body that you are ready to absorb nutrition and uh, certain enzymes are activated. And, and there's a whole slew of things that happen when you take your first bite. Um, it's different when you're drinking. So when you're drinking your food all the time, um, your body doesn't go through the same process. And, and so good digestion is really important. And so eating and chewing your food, um, telling your brain it's coming, um, really important to do. So um, eating whole fruit is preferable over, over blending it all the time. And a lot of people like to blend and that's great in the summer once in a while, but just eat your fruit more. Okay, so that is uh, that on fruits. And I wanna talk about dietary supplements now. Um, I have to start off by talking about regulation and safety. Um, so what is, a, what is a supplement? What's a dietary supplement? Um, it is something taken by mouth, made to supplement the diet um, and have one or more dietary ingredients, including vitamins, minerals, herbs, other bot botanicals, amino acids, enzymes, tissues from organs or glands or ac extracts. So that is the actual definition. Um, they are labeled as being dietary supplements. Um, companies, supplement companies, they're responsible for having evidence that their supplements are safe and that their labels are accurate, truthful, and not misleading. The companies are responsible. Rules for manufacturing and distributing dietary supplements are less strict than those for prescription or over-the-counter drugs, for obvious reasons. Um, the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, oversees dietary supplements, but in many cases, uh, they're not authorized to review them for safety and, effect and, and effectiveness before they go out to consumers. So a lot of the time, supplements are sent out onto the shelf and they haven't even been reviewed or, or um, um, tested by the FDA first, which is, if you think about it, sort of terrifying, right? The FDA estimates, estimates that there are more than 29,000 different dietary supplements on the market right now. Um, <clears throat> that number is a couple years old, so I'm, I'm going to guarantee it's over 30,000 30, different supplements on the market, and many of them are very poorly regulated, and um, you should just be very careful. I'll keep talking about this. So what's on the label might not be in the product. Um, for example, the FDA has found that prescription drugs, including anticoagulants like warfarin or anticonvulsants like phenytoin and others, they have found them in products being sold as dietary supplements. Um, we do not know how this happens, but these dietary supplements have prescription drugs in them, and the FDA has found certain inc incidences where this has happened. A study in 2012 found that 20% of the 127 supplements that they studied made illegal claims about their supplement. Um, claims could be like for weight loss, for um, blood pressure control, or um, for help with diabetes, um, glycemic control, that kind of thing. So they found that 20% of the supplements that they studied made illegal claims. Um, dietary supplements, they can interfere with the effectiveness of your medication too. So that's probably the most important thing to keep in mind. Um, as I know that many of you are on medications and supplements can interfere with their effectiveness, make them less effective. Natural does not always mean safe. Um, so for example, um, for a while there, I was seeing the Kava, Kava supplements, K-A-V-A. It's a member of the pepper family and I was seeing uh, people taking these kava supplements. Um, they take kava to relax or to relieve pain, that kind of thing. Um, but taking excessive kava can cause liver disease. Um, and we only have one liver, so our livers are very precious. Um, so the bottom line is if you're looking at supplements, you wanna look for um, vigorous testing. Uh, one of the main 
organizations that does testing is USP. So they have a, a label on the supplement that says USP on it, and they go through a vigorous testing process and the supplement company has to pay for that. Um, so if you see USP, that's probably a little safer. Um, you, you might know that what you're taking in that supplement is what they say that you're going to take. And so there's a little safety there. Um, the bottom line, make sure you read labels really carefully run your dietary supplements by your doctor before taking them. Do not buy dietary supplements at the dollar store. Yes, they sell them there. Don't do that. Um, just be very careful with supplements because they're poorly regulated and, and they can really interfere with your health and your medications. So let's chat really quick. Um, fiber is a huge, huge um, topic. I talk about fiber every day, all day. I talk about poop every day. It's, it's my life. and um, I'm getting good at talking about it. So I just want to mention neurogenic bowel again. Recommendations for fiber are roughly 30 grams of fiber for most people. Um, if you don't eat a high fiber diet and fiber is fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, then you want to start slowly. Um, I've discussed fiber quite a bit, especially in the last presentation that I did on, on carbs and veggies. I'm going to keep talking about it. You can Google soluble or insoluble fibers, but there's two different kinds of fibers and you can find lists um, for soluble or insoluble. Um, you probably want a mix of both soluble and insoluble if you have upper, upper neurogenic bowel and then more on the soluble side if you have lower neurogenic bowel. If you don't know uh, whether you have upper or lower, that is something that your physiatrist can tell you um, for sure. If, if you have upper or lower, it's helpful to know and then kind of plan your fiber around that. Um, I have found a lot of improvement with my patients with lower neurogenic bowel when they lean more on the soluble fiber type. So you can uh, look up online soluble fiber sources and kind of lean that way. Um, food is definitely more effective than supplemental resources, um, but you can, use, um, you can use supplemental fiber on top of your dietary fiber to kind of um, add a little bit more if, if you need to. And I wanna mention something quickly about neurogenic bladder. Um, the key thing to think about is hydration for bladder. Um, you wanna stay hydrated, make sure that you're drinking enough water. Uh, there's no real studies about fruit that pertain to bladder per se, but uh, the limited information we have about cranberry, which is a big one, the active component is a-type proanthocyanidin, and um, re the little research we have suggests that this particular component in cranberry has a role in preventing E. coli bacteria from sticking to the wall of your bladder. Um, however, most supplements and juices don't have enough of A-type proanthocyanidin to really make much of a difference. So, if you feel that cranberry juice or supplements are helping you, um, could be placebo, maybe not. Um, if it's helping, continue. Just make sure that what you're taking as far as your cranberry supplement is actual cranberry and nothing else. Um, so that is that. So fiber supplements. I'm going to take a sip of water. So again, better to get your fiber from food. Um, supplements don't provide nutrients, vitamins, and minerals that the fiber-rich foods I've been talking about do, but they can help contribute to the overall daily intake. Um, more adverse symptoms happen from fiber supplements, so you may feel more bloating or gas um, from fiber. And I loved our ashes talk about uh, beans and cauliflower. And um, yeah, some of these foods do, we have gut, uh, bacteria in our gut, and some of these foods do excite the bacteria. Bacteria gets all excited and creates more gas and that kind of thing with certain fiber containing foods. Um, but your body does adapt over time and um, cooked is usually better than raw, obviously. So keep that in mind when you're eating um, fruits and veggies. Uh, well, veggies particularly, cauliflower, broccoli, those things. Um, so you'll find that you'll have more adverse symptoms from taking fiber supplements. Um, fiber supplements can also decrease absorption of certain medications, um, aspirin, 
Carbamazepine is another one where if you're taking um, a lot of fiber supplements that can uh, decrease the absorption of that particular medication um, and aspirin. Fiber does affect blood sugar levels. So uh, if you're on insulin, if you have diabetes and you decide you wanna increase your fiber, you need to talk to your team because you might have to have your insulin adjusted. Fiber helps keep um, blood sugar spikes down and, and regulate, uh, kind of levels things out a little bit. So I highly recommend fiber for, um, for diabetes. And then with fiber, you wanna stay hydrated. Um, fiber supplements can cause problems when you're dehydrated. I've seen um, patients taking a lot of fiber supplements and uh, not drinking enough water, which is, I think we're all walking around with uh, chronic dehydration, um, pretty much everyone I talk to. Um, so you wanna stay hydrated. If you take, take or eat a lot of fiber and you're not hydrated, you can actually have opposite issue, um, constipation, blockages, that kind of thing. So be hydrated, drink a lot of water. And I wanna share this, it's so exciting. This is fairly new. I don't know if any of you have heard about this, but there's new research on kiwis. Um, there are new studies coming out now that look at those with irritable bowel syndrome, the constipation variety. And um, the participants in the studies ate kiwi fruits daily. Um, there are several studies, so various quantities. Um, defecation frequency increased and participants had reduced transit time meaning that they went more often, they had better bowel movements. Um, I read into it, what is it about kiwi? So kiwis have a ton of water holding capacity. Most fruits and vegetables have a lot of water in them, which is fantastic, but there's an enzyme in kiwis that's called actinidin. So that might play a role as a natural laxative. Um, in one of the studies, participants were eating two kiwi fruits a day, um, just two little kiwis. Kiwis have amazing vitamin C, by the way. So um, you're, you're also getting, they're, they're a green fruit, so you're getting a lot of those antioxidants too. But uh, the participants in the study were eating two kiwis a day and found that their bowel movements were um, improved uh, pretty substantially. So studies are ongoing and, and they're very promising. And I am pretty much gonna have everyone eating kiwi from this point on just to see it, if, it, if it helps with constipation. So try it and get back to me, let me know. All right, so let's chat about probiotics. Um, as I mentioned just a minute ago, our bodies have bacteria and good bacteria and we, we, we love our bacteria and that bacteria is used to digest food, destroy disease causing cells and produce vitamins. Um, there are no no two people the same. We have uh, little planets in, in our guts that are absolutely individual, different. They're, no two people have the same environment in their stomach. Um, probiotics are live organisms which are intended to have health benefits when consumed or applied to the body. That's the definition. Um, they can be found in yogurt or other fermented foods, in supplements and beauty products. Um, the most common microorganisms out there are lactobacillus, which is widely used in the hospital, and bifidobacterium. Um, different pro probiotics have different effects. Uh, there's a ton of research out there on probiotics that's been done, but we don't have any real clear answers about whether probiotics are helpful or safe for various conditions. So studies are definitely ongoing when it comes to probiotics. They're mostly safe for use in healthy people. Um, healthy people, but there's a big risk in, uh, in people with severe illness or compromised immune systems. So uh, people with cancer that are immunocompromised uh, should not be putting bacteria into their body. They uh, should not be doing that. Risk for probiotic um, products having other microorganisms besides those on the label. Again, it's a su supplemental issue. Um, so having other microorganisms besides the ones that you want so you do need to talk to your healthcare provider about taking probiotics, um, especially if you have any health issues. And as far as probiotics and spinal cord injury, um, there are some changes in the composition of bacteria um, in the gut when a spinal cord injury happens, which uh, disrupts the autonomic nervous system. So there's gut, gut changes that happen. There was a uh, research on rodents that suggests that a spinal cord injury causes gut dysbiosis or, or disruption in the microorganisms in the gut. Um, so this is kind of new research and it's ongoing. So let's, um, let's 
I'll follow it and share it when I see it. So let's chat about vitamin D. Oh goodness, pretty much everybody's deficient in vitamin D. Um, the prevalence in those with acute or chronic spinal cord injury uh, ranges from 32% with a deficiency, um, which is uh, um, usually under 20 nanograms. Um, and then third, it's 93% with insufficiency. So most people with a spinal cord injury are insufficient, meaning they're just, just under a normal level. Um, not severely deficient, but definitely not in a normal level. Um, the main factors, immobility, low physical activity and bed rest, not getting enough exposure to sunlight. Um, there's a lot of research going on when it comes to vitamin D and uh, spinal cord injury. So I will continue to follow what's happening and share it as I come across it. But as for just vitamin D in general, deficiency is associated with fracture and bone loss, um, excess mortality, infection, and many other diseases. Um, I recommend having your vitamin D checked every six months, unless you have a severe deficiency, and then you probably want to get it checked uh, sooner than that, just to get it into range and then check it every six months. Um, I just put the dosage amounts here, but there's two different kinds of vitamin D uh, supplement. Um, ergo calciferol, which is vitamin D2. This is what we see with more um, severe deficiency and usually it's a weekly dose. And then more moderate deficiencies can range anywhere from 1,000 to 4,000 units of uh, cholecalciferol, which is the other form, um, vitamin D3. Most of you, if you're taking a vitamin D supplement, are probably on cholecalciferol a daily dose. And I do want to say most uh, daily multivitamins like Centrum or One a Day, which are, um, um, they are tested rigorously. And I feel like they, they uh, the FDA, FDA regulates and sees those supplements that are most widely recognized. And those vitamins have 400 units of vitamin D, most of them. Uh, sun is the best source for vitamin D synthesis. Our bodies process vitamin D better when it comes from the sun. Um, if you can get outside in the middle of the day for 10 to 30 minutes, um, as much skin as able, don't, don't put on a hat and sunscreen and then go sit in the sun for 15 minutes. Um, you, you need to get out there, you know, with your skin, like your arms and your face, just get, just get some sun on you for a little bit, several times a week. Um, that'll help. Uh, those of you with darker skin tend to be more deficient. So I definitely want to keep vitamin D in mind. Um, and exposure time to sun varies. So it just depends on your skin sensitivity. If you have a history of uh, skin cancer or family with skin cancer, um, talk to your doctor, but I highly recommend getting, getting some sunlight um, several, at least several times a week. It's really good for your mental health too. Um, one, one more thing on the vitamin D. Uh, deficiency can actually um, lead to fatigue and mood disorders. So if you feel like you're fatigued and your your mood, you know, you check your vitamin D um, because uh, there is research out there on mood disorders and vitamin D deficiency. Um, so calcium and bone health. Osteoporosis is porous bone. It's common in about 80% of those with chronic spinal cord injury. And uh, the longer the time since the injury, the greater the bone loss. Um, bone loss is below the level of your injury. Uh, multiple reasons for bone loss, disuse, um, slow blood flow to limbs, poor nutrition, hormone alterations. There is uh, research out there right now on calcium and uh, osteoporosis and spinal cord injury. So I'll continue to read that and share it. Supplements do not prevent osteoporosis, calcium supplements. Um, but if you're supplementing, uh, your doctor's probably got you on calcium carbonate or calcium citrate. Those are the two that are preferred. Uh, side effects from supplementation or excessive calcium um, consumption include kidney stones, indigestion, constipation. Um, certain medications um, can change, the absorption can change or reduce like iron or thyroid medication. So if you're taking calcium, uh, chat with your doctor about, about your thyroid medication or your, or your iron uh, supplement. Um, you do need vitamin D to properly absorb calcium. So if you're taking a calcium supplement, but you're vitamin D deficient, you're not absorbing calcium as good as you could be. So you need 
to make sure your vitamin D level is uh, up to par um, when you're, when you're um, taking calcium. Talk to your doctor about supplements before you take them. I can't stress this enough. Um, get your calcium and vitamin D levels checked, both of them. And then uh, foods, different foods to consider. So calcium fortified, um, plant-based milks are great. Tofu is good. Beans, um, cereals that are calcium fortified, greens. Um, greens have lots of calcium in them too. And they're really good for you. And then I wanna chat real quick about skin integrity. I'm about done here. Um, adequate hydration, if you have skin issues, uh, it's crucial. You have to stay hydrated. Uh, more proteins needed for wounds, um, like pressure injuries and burns. Um, colorful diet with abundant variety, like I said, eating from the rainbow is, is super important for wound healing. Um, I do recommend if you have a wound or pressure ulcer multivitamin supplement, like a big well-regulated brand. Um, vitamin C supplements are great. They help with collagen synthesis, skin formation. Um, they're usually safe. They're water soluble vitamin. Um, so they're, you know, the, the chance of toxicity is low for them. Check with your doctor about vitamin C supplements, but um, that is something that you can supplement with if you have a wound. Um, and then old school recommendations suggested zinc, zinc for everyone with a wound or pressure ulcer, but the new research says that the, the, there is more of a risk to having a zinc supplementation. Uh, excessive zinc can kind of mimic what antibiotics do on the gut and can lead to a C. diff and all kinds of other things. So you wanna get your zinc level checked if you have chronic wounds that you're trying to heal, get your zinc level checked, ask your doctor to order a lab for you. And if you're deficient, then definitely wanna supplement that because it does help with wounds. So the last word about supplements, do you need a supplement? Um, these are the most common deficiencies based on the US dietary guidelines. So another strong argument to eating, eating the rainbow. Um, you can get, as I've gone through, slide after slide of colorful fruits and vegetables, my last presentation, you can get all of these nutrients by eating a colorful plant-based diet. Uh, so fear not, you, you know, um, these, these are common nutrient deficiencies, but most Americans don't follow a plant-based diet and they don't, um, they don't get adequate fruits and vegetables um, and whole grains. And so if you do, then, then you're likely not going to be deficient in any of these things. And then, Quick reminder, um, caloric density. I talk about this all the time. Where do fruits lie? Um, th this is a stomach and this has 500 calories in it, in the oil, like obviously you get nothing. Cheese, meat, grains and beans. You can eat a whole stomach worth of 500 calories of fruits and vegetables. What do you think is going to fill you up the best out of all of these things? Uh, here's another slide. Where do fr fruits live? They live down at the bottom of the graph here. Uh, you want to eat these green areas, uh, vegetables, fruits, unprocessed, complex carbs, um, which are uh, foods in their most natural state, like corn and, and then legumes or beans. So fruits are, they're way down there with veggies. And then this is hard to read. Um, but I put the website on there. I love this slide and I share this with a lot of my patients because it's, it's kind of a no brainer. Eat, you eat in the green. If you, if you're working on uh, weight loss or, or maintenance, you want to eat mostly on the left side of this graph. Um, as you can see, uh, nuts, seeds and oils and fats, which I'm going to talk about next time are on the far right. So if you need to gain weight, you want to probably have the more plant, the plant-based ones like nuts and seeds and, and healthy oils, but junk food and processed carbohydrates and animal products are up there. And uh, you eat more of the foods on the right and you, you'll probably gain weight. Uh, eat more on the left, healthy, all the nutrients your body needs, effortless weight loss, maintenance, uh, weight maintenance. So remember, there's room for other foods in, in your life but make the majority of your foods plant-based for health and easy weight loss and maintenance. Uh, aim for 90%. Nobody's perfect. Just most of your foods should be uh, plant-based. Eat abundantly uh, from your fruits and veggies, vary their color. Nutrition should be super fun. Um, and it's not what you eat during one meal, but the overall picture of your diet quality over time that has the most impact. Don't get all hung up over Christmas dinner, okay? Enjoy that Christmas dinner um, as safely as you can. 
and and then just get back to eating your your uh, plant-based um, meals the next day and we'll talk about fat for the next session um, i do have a lot to say about that and okay that's it awesome thank you shelly okay uh, we have a few questions. What are some of the good sources of uh, frozen fruit? All the colors. So I love blueberries, um, all the berries. There's, I think if you do Costco, Costco has a great um, giant bags of blueberries and raspberries and blackberries. Um, those are fantastic. Um, you can just take them out, thaw them out, throw them in your oatmeal, put them in a, in a smoothie. Um, you can do anything with berries, but um, I like frozen mangoes too. I've done their mangoes. Costco has good mangoes, um, frozen mangoes, um, basically anything. Look at the ingredients on the label. Make sure all you see on there is the fruit. That's it. Not, nothing like sugar, just, uh, just the fruit. Okay. Uh, next question. I am on a fixed budget, but I love berries. How do I sort of make that math work? Um, sales look for look for berries on sale um, berries are kind of a summer thing so um, it's kind of hard in the winter time I think for berries so you want to look for frozen berries on sale look for um, yeah buying buying organic is expensive so if, if you're on a budget then uh, buy buy your berries on a budget and just uh, give them a good rinse before you eat them okay uh, next question you highlighted uh, raspberries. I tend to find raspberries uh, go bad very quickly. Uh, is there something that I'm mm -hmm. not doing right? Don't wash them right away. Um, wash them right before you're going to eat them. Um, I know a lot of people like to wash wash things right when they get home or, or soon after that, but um, your best bet is just to, what I like to do is I like to take bear, uh, raspberries specifically because I love them, but take them, um, they're in a little uh, container. Um, I like to kind of gently pour them into another container um, with a paper towel on the bottom and, and just cover it and put it in the refrigerator. Um, there's something about, oh, and also if you find a moldy raspberry, get it out of there. It's, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but moldy raspberries tend to um, uh, affect the other raspberries around them. <laughs> so this goes with all fruit, but um, get rid of those little culprits and, and then just kind of gently, gently like dump your berries onto, um, into a container with a paper towel at the bottom. And that seems to help for me and it makes it last a little longer, but if not, just eat them. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, do you have any thoughts on uh, calcium oxalate urinary stone prevention? Uh, okay, so hydration, again, um, often overlooked. Uh, make sure you stay good and hydrated. Um, other than that, I really don't have much advice as long as you are drinking enough water. Um, that's really all I have. Uh, a lot of the time kidney stones happen with dehydration and, and that kind of thing. Or I have seen high protein diet, but I mean, that's kind of rare. All right, uh, next question. Difference between blueberries and wild berries. What are your thoughts on that? Flavor. <laughs> My brother lives in Maine. Uh, there's nothing like it, picking a wild Maine blueberry. Um, just fresher, you know, wild berries are, are fresher. They're, they're right off the, the vine usually. Um, and blueberries, I mean, it just depends on where you're getting your blueberries from, I guess. So the, the more local and um, fresher they are, the better, and they taste better. Okay. Oh, um, wild berries are tiny. That, I got to say that. Wild blueberries are tiny. <laughs> tinier than they're just a regular Yeah, blueberry. they're just, they're weird. They're, they're like tiny, <laughs> <laughs> especially the main, the main ones. Those are the ones, I mean, I've gone up there hiking with him, and, and they're just the tiniest little things, but they have more flavor than, than 10 regular blueberries. <laughs> right. All right, uh, this next question, you addressed it at the beginning of, and was dried fruits, but um, uh, you mentioned that uh, as long as they don't have sugar, then that they could be fine. But what kind of fruits and how would one go about preparing them um, you know, for, for the best kind of results and the uh, best sort of nutritional value? Dehydrator, um, I have a dehydrator. 
we just had a, a huge haul of persimmons from our persimmon tree and I have a um, net I think it's a Nesco dehydrator and you um you just slice them all uniform and put them in there and I I don't put sugar on them but they taste like there's sugar on them because they're so sweet but um, dehydrators are really, really good, especially if you grow your own fruit, if you have uh, abundant fruit and you need to use it so it doesn't go bad or you can give it to someone. But um, I think I answered that question, but dehydrating your own fruit is great. But just uh, if you buy dehydrated fruit, again, look at the label and make sure that all you see in the ingredients is just that fruit and that's it. Okay, uh, next question. What are your thoughts on smoothies? Um, they are refreshing and delicious in the summertime, but um, again, it's not something that I would recommend doing every single day. Um, again, speaking to the physiological response of chewing your food and um, that whole thing, um, I think they're wonderful and they're a great way to get, you know, if you, if you don't like to eat kale, throwing kale into a smoothie with uh, blueberries and banana, no one would ever know. That's how I used to get my kids to eat kale. <laughs> Um, but I would make smoothies once in a while and pack them with spinach and kale and then throw in blueberries for the color. Cause obviously if you're going to put greens in a smoothie, it's going to turn green and the kids get suspicious, right? Unless they love greens, but, and then you throw a banana in the sweetness from the banana just totally covers everything. But I like smoothies in the summertime, um, just as a treat for once in a while, but it's better to just eat your fruit. Okay. All right. Next question. Doing a back of the napkin count, uh, the amount of fruits that I would have to eat in order to meet all the various uh, sort of vitamin requirements sounds very extensive. Uh, am I doing this? Am I thinking about this wrong? Did you include vegetables? Um, so this is, fruits and veggies fall into the same category as far as antioxidants. Um, everything is different, every fruit and every vegetable. No, they're not the same, but um, but you need to count your veggies too. So um, all the same nutrients and antioxidants that I'm talking about with fruits, like they're in vegetables too. So um, yes, so you need to pick two to three fruits every day, um, mix up your fruits here or there. You're gonna have fruit with um, breakfast, probably have a piece of fruit with your lunch. If you like something sweet after dinner, then have a piece of fruit, that's three. So there's that. And then all the veggies that you have in your omelet or whatever you're making for breakfast, if you have something savory or um, your salad, I recommend a big salad. If you can do a big salad every day, that would be fantastic. But um, whatever vegetables you have with lunch and dinner count toward all this too, so. And you mentioned that uh, to add fruit to the salad, so. Sure, yeah. Kill two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, next question. Your thoughts on organic versus non-organic? Uh, so again, um, organic is is great. You know, there's no there's no pesticides, and I did a whole section on organic during the last presentation I did. So refer to that. But um, if you're on a budget and you can't find um, um, reasonably priced organic fruits and vegetables, um, just give them a good washing. Um, wash them, scrub them. If you have something that you can scrub, like just just underwater, use your hand, scrub whatever you can do to just clean them the best that you can. Um, you're better off just cleaning thoroughly your produce, um, your non-organic produce, than you are avoiding it altogether because it's not organic. Okay, last question. Uh, I often struggle finding out where, where the fruits are coming from at my produce, uh, at the produce department. Mm -hmm. What is the best way other than tracking down, you know, the employee to and ask uh, <laughs> someone, you know, where everything has come from? Okay, not, so if they're not labeled. Yeah, so a lot. I mean, I I I go to Lucky's um, once in a while for my produce, and and they're pretty good about um, putting their or um, their place of origin on labels. Um, if if you're struggling with your store, um, maybe see if you have a farmers market. That's just a no brainer. If you can find yourself a farm, like in safer times, hopefully by spring when when farmers markets will explode with. The, all the good stuff, but um, my best bet would, um, you know, my advice for that would just be if you can't see any place of origin on the label in the store, you may have to ask if, if you need to. Um, 
generally a lot of the stuff that's on sale is, well, it's either going bad, they're trying to get rid of it, or maybe it might be in season. So familiar, familiarize yourself of uh, the things that are in season right now um, in this month. And there's some really good resources online you can find. Um, I think you can just put in your zip code and it'll tell you all year what's in season every month. And so then that'll kind of help you a little bit. Okay. And in fact, um, Arash, uh, who's also with us, just commented on that, that uh, know your seasons and which fruits are available during that time of the year, like apples in the fall, peaches in the summer, cherries mm -hmm. in spring and summer. Yeah. Yeah. And you might find that, um, that things are on sale that, that are more seasonal um, in the store, too. So um, because they're more abundant and they, you know, they have a lot of them. So just get familiar. Arash is right. Get familiar with what's in season and try to eat that way. It's a great way to mix up your, um, your foods too. I tend to not eat tomatoes in the winter because we have such fantastic tomatoes in the summertime. It's just, um, there's no comparison. And so if I have to have a tomato for some recipe or something, I will, but I tend to not throw tomatoes in my salad. And then when the first one hits in the summertime, it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Are you saying that because uh, you feel that the tomatoes are being sort of shipped from far distances and they lose they, their... They do, but they're pinker and they're, they're you know, not they're not the same. There's just no comparison. So I think I've been spoiled by our garden. Um, so the things that we, like zucchini, I, I don't even want to look at a zucchini in the, in the store. I, I tend to lean, lean more toward uh, cruciferous veggies and tons of greens in the winter time. I do a lot of broccoli and cauliflower and uh, kale and greens and spinach and that kind of thing and, um, and root vegetables in the winter time. And then in the summer, then my garden gives me everything I need for the summertime. Yeah. And Arash is suggesting now is a good time to eat citrus. Mm -hmm. A lot of California grown citrus for the next few months. Yeah. Um, so Shelly, um, on the web, it's like the wild, wild west. If you go and do a search, um, you have to do a lot of work to figure out you know, what sources are biased versus unbiased. Are there any particular sites that you have found that are sort of, they are the go-to sites that explain the nutritional value of, of everything, whether it's the fruits and vegetables? Um, you know, there's a website that I uh, used a lot when I was a student, a nutrition student. Um, um, I think it's called, I think it's called World's Healthiest Foods, but I'm going to check while we're talking. Um, I like that. I like nutritionfacts.org. That was a good one. Um, that is, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of the book, uh, What Not, How Not to Die. Um, but this guy is, his name is Dr. McGregor. He, um, he likes to look at research and he's written some books and stuff and he's more or less non nonprofit, but he's done a ton of research on food and the plant-based diet. Um, it's kind of healthy, easy to digest food uh, information on um, plant-based eating. But as far as nutrients, um, world's healthiest foods. Yeah, I think that might be that. Um, this guy, no, I don't. Yeah, I think that is it. World's healthiest foods has a lot of, um, like you could pull up blueberries. I'm going to pull up blueberries right now and take a look, but um, it tells you more than you ever needed to know about blueberries. Oh yeah. So this one has a lot of information on um, specific foods and the nutrients that are in them. That's kind of helpful. Okay. So you could check that out. All right. So world's healthiest foods and nutritionalfacts.org are yeah. two of the nutritionfacts.org. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, those are all the questions that we've had. Um, once again, everyone, um, the folks at the Reef Foundation made tonight's presentation possible, but really Shelley is the person that made tonight's presentation possible. And I'm really happy to, um, to notify everyone that Shelley, along with Arash, have agreed to continue with these monthly presentations uh, all throughout next year. So uh, we had a meeting last week and uh, we're going to be formulating a sort of a plan where the two of them are going to be collaborating on some uh, in some months and then in others, uh, Shelly will uh, pick a subject and uh, and do a sort of a more of a major presentation on it. So thanks, Shelly, for agreeing mm -hmm. to do that. And uh, and also the other thing that we're going to start doing is 
uh, we're going to start building a, sort of a video library as well as content library on our website, on the norcaliceci.org's website, that will be dedicated to food and nutrition and cooking um, exclusively. Um, so look for all of that stuff uh, coming up in the next few weeks that we're going to start. Uh, I'm so out. excited about this. This has uh, been a project that we've been talking about for a while. So I'm super happy to work with uh, with NorCal and work with Arash. And this is a dream come true as far as um, it puts all the work that I've done with spinal cord injury community all together in one little place. And I'm super stoked about it. Well, we appreciate your devotion, truly, uh, Shelley. Uh, thanks so much for caring so much about the spinal cord injury community. And so appreciate everything that you've done. Um, okay, everyone, as I mentioned, uh, tomorrow morning in your inboxes will be the recording of tonight's presentation as well as Tuesday's presentation that was on um, cooking with vegetables that, that Arash uh, did. Uh, as I mentioned, um, I think it'll be a good combination of videos for the two of you to, um, to take in. Um, so have a good night, everyone. Uh, have good holidays. And uh, this was really our last presentation for the year. We have one more sort of a fun thing later on in the year with uh, Scott Chesney, but uh, I won't uh, take up too much of your time. But have a good evening, everyone, and, and be safe. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Stay take safe. Bye-bye now. Bye.